Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Again, I'm Scott Kelly, and I'm here to talk about our project, which was actually titled Integrated Wildlife Management for Sustainable Agriculture. <clears throat> and this project, like so many other SARE projects, was conducted to solve a problem that not only we had, but we felt maybe uh, so many other uh, people were having, having these experiences. So we're fortunate to have organizations like SARE uh, to support our community. So we have a UPIC operation in Kearney, Missouri. Everybody thinks we're in Kearney and Brenton. We're in Kearney, Missouri. Uh, you can come pick your produce. You can weigh and pay on the honor system. Um, and you know where your produce came from because you picked it yourself. Kearney's close enough to Kansas City Metro that we have a variety of customers from different demographics. And here, uh, Carrie is uh, hoeing these rows, and I'm pretty sure that I was in the tractor when I took that <laughs> picture, so. So we have young pickers who drag their parents out. We get a lot of feedback that they want to go see Carrie, which is a good thing but I think that it's probably because she bribes them with rides in the golf cart. <laughs> and we have seniors that come out. They enjoy getting out in the garden. They enjoy spending time out there. Without all the hard work, they get to pick their produce. And uh, this lady knows her tomatoes pretty well. She was telling us all about that. <clears throat> but what really brings our customers out is sweet corn, and that's kind of the crux of this, this presentation. So kids look funny at us when we tell them just pick that and eat it right there raw, uh, and then they look like this. So I don't think she lost her teeth right there at <laughs> that moment. <clears throat> and we, of course, you can notice we have a pretty good crop of crabgrass that year too. So Carrie here is the green thumb of our operation, and that's why we named it Carrie's U-Pick, so if something went wrong, we could <laughs> talk to her about it. <coughs> but I'm the one in, ch in charge of sweet corn, so that's I'm kind of in charge of the sweet corn, and we've got the best sweet corn in northwest Missouri, and all of Nebraska. <laughs> 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 But early on, we had, a, we had a serious problem, right? Everybody's probably seen this. It's grown sweet corn. So who's out there? Who's getting in there and damaging our corn, right? So we ended up catching them red-handed, right? And we determined that through a lot of scientific uh, investigation that uh, deer were bad, and raccoons were bad for sweet corn. <laughs> so we needed, uh, we needed an idea to protect our produce from these garden pests. So we called up Uncle Albert <laughs> and asked him to give us a hand or give us some advice. And he said that you have to change their behavior and their patterns. And we thought, yeah, right, whatever. So, so, so that's, we changed our behavior and their patterns. So the very first night after that, we put out all of our Halloween decorations. <laughs> that's not a joke. <laughs> and then we built this electric fence. Surely the, surely the deer and raccoons uh, would stay out. But that wasn't, we knew that wasn't going to be a permanent solution for us. Because of our system and our operation, you know, that we both work full-time jobs, we use tractor and implement as much as possible. Limited access with fencing wasn't, uh, for us in our operation and for our customers, just wasn't going to work. Customers worried about electric fences, and the Halloween stuff kept scaring the kids away. <laughs> and they're paying parents, so we couldn't use that. 
but we still needed to keep the critters out. They think our sweet corn is the best also, so we're not the only one. <laughs> But we needed to consider the money aspect of it, of what we could do, because I always think of how much stuff is going to cost in dozens of sweet corn sold, right? <coughs> and so, but we thought that if we had an innovative idea that could help other people, including us, that we could find some place to help us with funding that idea. Because Albert, Uncle Albert wasn't much help, right? So we'd been subscribing to several and following several organizations. Of course, uh, SARE and uh, Lincoln Universities. Uh, there's Jim Pierce up there. You'll see him probably tomorrow. <coughs> and the University of Missouri Extension. And we thought that if we had a unique idea, could we find one of these that would fit with our operation and <laughs> there would be something that would work for us. And there's, some, there's a lot of different, for us there was a lot of different uh, uh, ways to go. There were 100% grants, matching fund grants, reimbursement grants, short-term funding. We had to look at recipient requirements. Uh, the difficulty of grant applications I've done, I did one that was almost 70 pages long, you know, so uh, we didn't get that one, but anyhow, so we had to think about all those things. We found that we were a beginning farmer or rancher, so that gave us uh, some advantage there in some instances, but it ended up that SARE was the best fit for us. The research aspect, the available funding and the ease of application and the support network especially made sense for us. So we put together our project and nicknamed it the Guardian Project. And I'm sorry that's not a real good picture but you'll kind of get the gist of it here. Which consisted of myself Carrie O'Dell, who's with me today. Dick St. Clair is uh, basically, he was our kind of our laser expert, uh, constructed the lasers themselves. Uh, Jim Pierce, again, with Lincoln University, helped us quite a bit. And a special thanks to my friend, Kurt Mays, Mays Plumbing, who loaned us his trencher all summer long. So, So we discussed this issue with the extension agent from the U University of Missouri, Marlon Bates. Oh, well, that came out good, didn't it? Anyhow, so we got a letter of recommendation from Marlon. At the time, he was with the University of Missouri, he's with, with uh, uh, K State, right? So, <coughs> so back to our idea, right? Here's another smart guy with ideas. But the idea kind of went this way. So if you had a 120 volt source controlled by two pho photo cells to two transformers for 12 volt DC for the laser and one for 32 volt AC for the sprinkler controller that was energized by tripping the laser to another photo cell that would close a relay, this would happen. The deer would trip the laser and the sprinkler would shoot the deer and the deer would leave, <laughs> right? Now try to explain that in a grant application. <laughs> so against all odds, we received a grant from North Central SARE, SARE for a two-year project with, with annual reporting. And we proceeded to build these lasers and photocell devices that are full of electronic stuff, which is basically inside there's a, there's a laser and there's a transformers in there. Uh, there's an Arduino chip. Uh, to, it's like a little computer that controls uh, the relay. 
uh, in a photo cell to receive the laser. And we stuff them into a basically a five inch by five inch vinyl fence post to house it. So then we arrange them in what I call a, a daisy chain fashion around the U-pick so that the laser from one box is pointed at the photo cell on the next box and that laser to the next photo cell and it goes basically all the way around the garden. Then we installed miles and miles, seemed like, of <laughs> sprinkler piping and sprinklers. So that, you know, and we used uh, as much child labor as possible. <laughs> There's my buddy's trencher there, so that was good to have. Then we learned many valuable lessons, <laughs> like don't put the valves so far down in the ground, <laughs> right? So basically what that ended up, this is a Google Earth image of our garden. It's about an acre and a third-ish. And you can kind of see, I don't know if there's a little pointer thing. You can kind of see these little, these are the little laser boxes around there. They're kind of hard to see. And the yellow line kind of represents that daisy chain of a, basically a laser perimeter for that acre and a third ish. So then of course, once that was all done, and I apologize for this, but this is how we this is how we tested it. So, so getting that deer to cooperate <laughs> was a real issue, and we were pretty much soaked by the end. By the, it was about the twelfth take. So, so anyhow, um, that took a lot longer than that was about a year of all that going on. But anyhow, the combination of the laser trip wire and impact sprinkler system automatically comes on at dusk and off at dawn, and it protects about an acre and a third of produce, including our precious sweet corn, right? And that actually uh, coincides with our hours of operation, that is from sun up to sundown. Our, our customers come out any time that it's daylight, pretty much, so <coughs> they come out whether we're here, whether we're not. Some people like the solitude, some people like, you know, socializing and so on and so forth, so. So we were very happy to report. Oh, there's another picture, basically. You can kind of see the laser. It's hard to take a picture of a laser in the daytime, where, you know, so. And there again, there's a sprinkler going off. So we were happy to report that, and really I was kind of astonished that when it's operational, we don't have any raccoon intrusions or any deer intrusions. So we made the paper, right? <laughs> well, not really, but you can get online and do this paper thing. And, <laughs> and impress your friends, right? But we do have a, do have a Facebook, uh, we do have a Facebook presence uh, and, uh, with the Guardian itself and with Carrie's You Pick, right? And uh, so we can spread the word about our project. But for full disclosure, okay, because I don't want anybody to think that everything's perfect, <coughs> the laser will go on for miles and miles, the laser itself. So you don't want to aim it at your neighbor's windows, right? <laughs> Any ground movement, like after a heavy, we have them sitting on concrete um, pads, like, so any ground movement, like a heavier rain or something like that, will cause that laser to move. So, because you have to aim the laser. So, so we ha you have to 
every night just about we have to go out and at least aim two or three of those lasers to make sure that they're hitting the photo eye from the, for the next one. So, so generally, <coughs> some of those have to. How many did it take to get nine? Uh, we have nine. Only nine. Yeah, and um, since we're talking a little bit about that, the limitate the number generally is determined by changes in elevation. Because seriously, I mean, really, you could point that laser a mile from one box to the other box if you, if you were flat. <coughs> we were trying to maintain about an 8 or 10 inch, maybe at most a foot, elevation above the ground. And then, of course, the laser straight. Well, if the ground goes like this and you've got to put another one there, does that make sense? So, because the raccoons are that tall, right? So, in the, you know... So we had, we had to get that to where we get the deer's legs if they walk through it, or we had to keep it low enough that even baby raccoons, because they go in and so on and so forth. So <coughs> it, it, it does deter these critters. We don't have, when it's operational, it does, and it does change their behavior. We found one year that we could even turn off the water, right? But the next year, all their offspring weren't trained. And so the being, you know, what Uncle Albert said about changing their behavior and their patterns, right? That really became a, we could realize that because uh, we'd, we'd get, you'd see little baby raccoons inside the garden, you know, their paw prints, and you'd see the adults outside. So we were changing that, modifying it. Uh, <coughs> Again, the laser needs to be shot at the photo eye, and if it's not shooting at the photo eye, the water goes off. And it's timed to where it goes off for 30 seconds and turns, and it turns itself back off again. But then, if it's not aimed, it turns on again. So, a couple of times we had a pretty outrageous water bill while we were sleeping, the things, you know, going off and stuff like that. So there's, there's some downsides to it. I mean. And I think the last and most important thing is if there's a conflict between the laser device and a brush hog, <laughs> the brush hog usually wins. <laughs> so really, you know, that's it. I mean, we've got, uh, we want to thank the Nebraska Sustainable Agriculture Society for letting us present this. And of course, uh, North Central SARE, uh, University of Minnesota and Lincoln University there, and Lincoln University's Innovative Far Small Farmers Outreach Program that were all very helpful in this project. So, we have any other questions? How many sprinkler heads, right? Or sprinkler, how many sprinkler heads? I think we've got 36, I think. And that's a distance thing. You have so much water pressure, blah, blah, blah. This sprinkler shoots 30 feet. That sprinkler shoots 30 feet. So basically, they're about 60, 50, 60 feet apart. And that's also how far does your laser go, because the laser, each individual box, in the you can't see it, but in the ground, there's a controller, and that controller controls all the sprinklers back. So... If that makes if that makes sense, so yeah, I think that at most I think we have four in one place because it's you know up towards the north end there it's pretty like I said it's flat it only changes in elevation about six inches so you know you can really stretch out it's when it's you know we got other places so that distance kind of can has kind of um, determines how many heads you're going to have in between and of course water pressure too so. Did I either consider any other deterrent? Um, uh, a big dog, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> really a lot of times they say a, a large guard dog or big dog. Or I really got the idea from, you've seen these little sprinklers you hook to the end of your hose, right? Maybe not, and you stick it in the ground and the dog comes over and the neighbor's dog comes over and defecates in your yard. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, that's what they're designed. So when the dog comes over there, sprinkler. So I kind of saw that, and I thought, well, you know, that's great, but, you know, it's a little, so I just had to take that onto a little bigger scale. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, 
the fencing just wasn't, you know, the fencing just wasn't going to work for us. I mean, normally you just put electric fence around there and you get it, you know, and we, and we did that for a little while while we were getting this all up and running. Um, and we found, you know, you couldn't put it, you couldn't put it this high off the ground because little, because little raccoons, baby raccoons go under and then you couldn't put that high because big ones would jump over and, <laughs> yeah. but so we couldn't use those things. No, no, each box there's a 120 volts that runs all the way around there in the trench and then it stubs up to each of those lasers and then it goes back in the ground into the, into the controller. Does that make sense? Refinements. Um, <coughs> yeah, we're, we're working on, there's, there's a couple of things that we're working on. Uh, those lasers, uh, Nick, very smart guy, and he actually built those lasers from scratch. Uh, because really at that point in time, you know, looking at a, you know, it doesn't have to be an industrial laser, just a good quality laser, but still those were back then, they were a hundred bucks a piece just for the laser. So he built those lasers from scratch way more economically. So, but we're looking at some, and it's a large driver and now you can get those lasers uh, with the driver built in and I think I paid 40 bucks for it or something like that. So. We're looking at some of those refinements. I'd like to look more into solar uh, as far as having a solar situation where uh, you know you could run it all off of a uh, like a little garden battery, garden tractor battery or something like that. Uh, have to find some controllers that are 12 volt. I never I wasn't very successful at finding any 12 volt controllers for the sprinkler system. <coughs> and that would simplify things quite a bit. Have nine, nine laser boxes around there, yeah. And they go out. I mean, that's probably the that's probably the biggest malfunction we have is is that the lasers eventually burn out. Now some of them go on for a couple of years, and the other ones go on for a couple of months. So it's it's kind of a, and we're not sure why to be truthful with you. But I might I add that. You know, this just, uh, this doesn't have to be water necessarily. I know some people have had, some people have had uh, success with propane cannons. You could shoot fireworks at them. I don't, you know what I'm saying? It, you know, the, the, it just triggers whatever you want to trigger. Or, you know, yeah. Believe me, I've, <laughs> I, 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 I